Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the New School. Uh, I'm delighted to be hosting this very special event today um, on behalf of the India-China Institute, ICI. Um, normally, Ashok Gurung, the head of the India-China Institute, would be here. Uh, he's traveling in Beijing, but he asked me uh, last minute somehow to come um, uh, speak about this really important work. Uh, my name is Nitin Sahani. I'm a faculty member in the School of Media Studies at the New School. And uh, I'm also um, collaborating with Ashok on many of the projects that ICI does. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, Kashmir and the legacy of social and political changes in Kashmir through creative writing and film. Uh, we have with us uh, Sarah Singh, who's an award-winning filmmaker, and also Muhammad Janaith, who's a doctoral student at CUNY, who are both experts um, in this field and have spent a lot of time working in Kashmir. Uh, I will be saying a bit about them and introducing them before they come up um, in our panel discussion afterwards. Um, I want to say something about uh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah was born in Patiala, Punjab in India, and she moved to the US in 1974. Um, she's completed two feature length films of which we'll be seeing short excerpts and um, is working on a third film now. She's worked in both film and TV, and uh, as you can see in the bio here, she has a great body of work. Um, her, most recent, her first solo show was at the Prithvi Gallery in Bombay, and uh, she's also on the board of the Sindhi Voices Project. I won't read the whole thing. Um, you don't need to know my bio, I, I teach here. Uh, but Muhammad Janaid is a doctoral candidate in anthropology, and his research is on history, violence, and pol political subjectivity in Kashmir. And he's contributed a number of essays, as you can see, dealing with um, resistance movements uh, in Kashmir, and also his writings have come in a number of periodicals. Uh, so we're really delighted to have him join us today as well. Now, we're going to be watching three short films, three excerpts from Sarah's films, and, get, and have a discussion afterwards. And I'll be in inviting Sarah just in a moment to give us a background introduction to these films. But before I do that, for many of you who may not be as familiar with Kashmir, I wanted to give you just a little bit of context. And to do so, I thought I would read for you um, something from um, a, a Kashmiri-based writer, um, Basharat Peer. He wrote a book called Curfew Night that uh, is his first um, autobiographical um, uh, book. And he is uh, trained as a journalist, uh, also went to Columbia School of Journalism, and, uh, and has written for a number of periodicals in the West, uh, but spent a significant amount of his time in Kashmir. So I thought I would use um, Basharat's uh, text. I actually met him uh, in March of 2010 at MIT when he gave a talk there, and he um, um, was very, very uh, passionate about his work. But I think he would be a good voice to at least give us some context. So I'll read for you um, a short text that at least gets us situated. Kashmir was the largest of the approximately 500 princely states under British sovereignty as of 1947. Kashmir was predominantly Muslim, but ruled by a Hindu Maharaja, Hari Singh, uh, and the popular leader, Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah. Pref the Sh Sheikh Muhammad preferred India to Pakistan and an independent Kashmir to both. When India was violently partitioned in 1947, both Singh and Sheikh Abdullah sought time before deciding Kashmir's fate. In October 1947, however, tribesmen from the northwest frontier province of Pakistan, supported by the Pakistani army, invaded Kashmir, forcing their hand. Singh decided to join India, and Sheikh Abdullah, who was a friend of the new Indian Prime Minister Nehru, supported him. In January of 1949, the fighting stopped after the UN intervened. The UN endorsed a, a plus fight for Kashmiris to determine which country they wanted to belong to and created a ceasefire line. The line still divides Kashmir into Pakistan-controlled and India-controlled parts today, what we call the Line of Control, LOC. The agreement of a session that Hari Singh signed with India in October 47 gave Kashmir great autonomy at the time. India controlled only defense, foreign affairs, and telecommunications, whereas Kashmir had its own constitution and flag, and heads of local government were called president and prime minister. Gradually, this autonomy disappeared. In 53, India jailed Sheikh Abdullah, who was then Kashmir's prime minister, and after he implemented a radical land reform and gave 
a speech suggesting the possibility of an independent Kashmir. In the following decades, India installed puppet rulers, eroded the legal status of Kashmiri autonomy, and ignored the democratic rights of all Kashmiris. Sheikh Abdullah remained in jail for around 17 years. When he was released, he signed a compromise with the Indian government in which he gave up the demand for a plus fight that the UN had recommended. He spent the remaining years of his life in power, and that period, which is also Basharat's childhood, was relatively peaceful. But in 1987, five years after his death, the Indian government rigged state elections, arresting occupation candidates and terrorizing their supporters. I'm going to pause there and then move to just one more piece of his text where he talks about his memory growing up in Kashmir um, as an adolescent. It was January 1990. I was 13. The war of my adolescence had started. Today, I fail to remember the beginnings. I fail to remember who told me about Azadi or freedom. Who told me about militants? Who told me it had begun? I fail to remember the date, the name, the place, the image that announced the war, a war that continues still. Time and again, I look back and try to cull from my memory the moment that, it was, that was to change everything I had been and would be. The night of January 20th, 1990 was long and sad. Before dinner, my family gathered as usual around the radio for the evening news on the BBC World Service. Two days earlier, Jagmohan, an Indian bureaucrat, infamous for his hatred of Muslims, had been appointed the governor of Jammu and Kashmir. He gave orders to crush the incipient rebellion. Throughout the night of January 19, Indian paramilitary men slammed doors in Shirnagar, which was the capital of Kashmir, and dragged out young men. By morning, hundreds had been arrested, curfew was imposed. Kashmiris poured out onto the streets in the thousands and shouted slogans of freedom from India. This was in 1990. 26 years later, much hasn't changed. And Sarah will bring us up to speed on all of that through her body of work, as well as Muhammad Janet when he had a chance to talk to him in our panel. So with that, let me have Sarah come introduce her films, and we'll uh, return for discussion after that. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, wonderful weather day. And uh, I just quickly say about these three films, the first one, as he mentioned, these are all excerpts from three different films. And the first one is uh, from a film I made that was uh, very much about the exploration of partition. And uh, that is from 2007. And uh, then the next film is a film that is a work in progress, and it is a piece that uh, is a, um, a portrait of um, a, a specific type of music in Kashmir. And then the third one is an excerpt from my new film, which has already had its world premiere uh, this year at the Victorian Albert Museum. And this is a, about a 10-minute excerpt, which is the Kashmir segment from that film, and that's a, a surrealist fiction. So they're all three very different uh, styles and from different uh, um, time periods. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Uh, so maybe I can start a little bit about, start with your personal journey. Um, as someone who's spent time in Kashmir, as someone who's spent time here at the New School, journey both as a, a filmmaker, writer, or an artist. Um, how did we get here? Uh, well, so in 1989, I came uh, to take a painting course here, and uh, my professor I had at the time is here, which I'm very happy about. Uh, so I started out as a, as a fine artist in painting and photography uh, primarily, and, but I really wanted to work in film, but uh, I just didn't think I had really the personality to do that kind of thing, because you have to be very collaborative, you have to be very uh, sort of outside yourself. Um, uh, but uh, when I got to a certain point in my life, I felt if I really wanted to do this, I needed to start. And so uh, I started working here in New York on different productions and uh, uh, decided that what I really wanted to do, of course, was my own work because that's what you want to do as an artist. And uh, so I, I really wanted to do something in South Asia because I was born there, but we, we've spent most of our life here. 
And uh, after September 11th, I felt I really wanted to know more about what was going on in Pakistan and, and in that part of the world. And uh, so I was looking at what would be an interesting topic to pursue, and I decided on partition, and I realized that there wasn't very much done in terms of film, uh, as far as like documentary and that kind of thing uh, on the topic. And uh, so I knew that that would take me through Pakistan and uh, across the area where I was born in Punjab, and I could understand a little bit better about that part of the world. Um, and if I was able to do it in time, it would be ready for the 60 years, which was in 2007. And so that first clip that you saw was from uh, work I did in 2006 and 2007. And uh, so you can, s it's, some of the things uh, are still very much the same. Um, and then, uh, and then after that, what my intention was to really try to work on a kind of a feature-based work. And so this really laid the groundwork in terms of being able to go there and to work in the region and understand what it would be like. And then uh, I decided that I was interested in working in this similar sort of area, i.e. I. North India, and uh, with similar themes that I got out of the documentary, which were themes of uh, identity, fragmentation, violence. Uh, so I developed a story uh, which I wrote over many years and kept rewriting, rewriting, and then finally uh, was able to actually go and do this film and uh, had the good fortune to have a couple of these amazing actors uh, agree to be a part of the film. Uh, and that's when I made this uh, surrealist fiction piece, which is called A Million Rivers. And uh, at the time I was in Kashmir, uh, which was in uh, March of 2014, uh, was a month exactly when uh, this uh, Sufi master had just passed away and they were doing this memorial concert. So it was in the back of my mind to work with uh, music in, in South Asia and um, I was really interested in Sufi music, and uh, so years before I had thought that that would be something I'd like to do, but I didn't, you know, I wasn't able to pursue it. So this just kind of, in a way, like sort of fell into my lap at the time, and I was very happy about that because I was very keen on doing something, and I sort of started a little series and did another piece in, in, in Lahore as well. So, um, but now I think I'm done with working in South Asia. I want to, uh, work with some of the similar actors, same actors, maybe, you know, go to a different location in the world and do the next project. Um, but that, that was kind of, uh, you know, the literal journey. Yeah. Can I ask you to say something about your own family's connection to Kashmir, if there was such? Or <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't know that there's a direct connection, but the state where I was born is next to Kashmir, so there is a connection in that sense where it's contiguous. And uh, at one time, that it was considered Greater Punjab uh, under Maharaja Ranjit Singh, which was a much you know greater um, uh, uh, region. Um, but other than that, no, I mean. Not that, not that I know of, the, yeah. of a direct. So you've just been kind of visiting Kashmir on your own as a filmmaker, as a Well, it was totally important to the story of when I was pursuing partition. It was absolutely a major um, element in that. Uh, and then when I decided to make this next film, I felt I was really interested in uh, focusing on this relationship of Kashmir and India. And uh, so that's how this sort of played out as far as developing the character and how the story kind of like evolved. I, I want to bring Mohammed into the conversation. And uh, Mohammed, I, I believe you grew up in Kashmir. Yes. And uh, you've, you've been doing your graduate work here for some time, but you've also been going back and doing reporting and writing about Kashmir. Um, can you tell us something about um, your, your childhood in Kashmir first and, um, and the landscape, the way the social and political landscape has changed over the last couple of decades. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I grew up in Kashmir. I'm a Kashmiri. Uh, in 1989, when Sarah was at new school, <laughs> I was nine years old. 
in Kashmir and um, trying there was that was the moment when the, one of the first uh, self-determination movements like really exploded on the scene um, we had mass protests and suddenly we uh, witnessed tens and thousands of Indian soldiers occupying cinema halls um, hospitals our school my school was under occupation for a year so uh, I didn't have much of a schooling um, in the sense in that sense of the word it was basically trying to survive um, that time so there was a massive insurgency tens of thousands of people died during that time uh, so my first um, my teenage years were really spent in Kashmir until 1918 uh, 98 when I left and went to uh, study in North India to in Aligarh Muslim University and then to Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, my intense desire during that time was first to tell the story from the Kashmiri point of view, but also to listen to what India thought about us as Kashmiris, mm. uh, which led me to study Indian discourses on nationalism um, um, during my time at JNU. Uh, I went back in 2008 uh, to Kashmir um, to teach at a university. Um, and again, this was a year when massive protests uh, started uh, against what was uh, government had transferred a large piece of land to uh, a kind of autonomous body for pilgrims and stuff. And But it led to a summer of protests in which more than 60 people were shot dead on the streets, thousands were injured. Uh, 2009, I came to New York to study uh, because I couldn't do much work in Kashmir. Uh, and then I went back uh, as part of my doctoral research uh, to do field work in 2014. Uh, I spent 18 months there um, studying the formation of political subjectivity, especially trying to understand the historical roots of the self-determination movement. Uh, I was especially uh, interested in understanding um, how youth become involved in the political struggle. This summer, uh, I went back again to tie some loose ends and also to visit my parents who live in South Kashmir in a city which was historically called Islamabad but now is also called Anantanag. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the quick things that I wanted to also say is that why uh, uh, this moment is really in important right now is that we have just gone through and we're still undergoing um, days of military siege and lockdown in Kashmir. Um, there have been like more than 100 days of uh, curfews and uh, shutdowns. Around 100 people have been shot to death, and uh, children as young as eight years old. I know a couple of people who were my participants in my research who are in jail. Um, some of them have been injured. There are like 15,000 people who are injured, and most of them, many of them, from what are called uh, pellet guns. These are high velocity lead pellet you know, pump action guns that are not, that are banned in most places, but are, um, you know, used on Kashmiris on a regular basis. 300 people have completely been blinded during these last three months. So it's a, it's a intense moment for Kashmir. Um, it just brings back all those memories from the early 90s and then the 2008 and 10 when these protests were going on. Um, I wanted to um, use the opportunity to give you full disclosure about my family's connection to Kashmir. Um, my father was in the Indian Army in the 60s, uh, working in the civil, um, civil engineering. He was, he was building roads in Kashmir in areas that had no roads at all. And um, he spoke very little about his time in Kashmir after he retired from the Army. We were in Iran for most of the time I grew up. And uh, only a few years ago, I interviewed him to, to get a sense of what he felt about his time in, uh, not only Kashmir, but he also worked in Assam and many other areas of the Himalayas. And uh, he broke down and told me about some of the times when he was there. Uh, it was a very beautiful period of his life as a young man in his 20s, but also devastating from what he saw. Um, and he had a pretty major road accident uh, traveling down a bridge in Kashmir and nearly died. Um, so he doesn't talk much about Kashmir, but I think along with many Indians, uh, he is among those who deny that India has 
um, a strong occupying role in Kashmir. He, he still doesn't quite uh, agree with me. Uh, we, we, don't disagree, we don't agree on India's role in Kashmir. Uh, most Indians uh, um, don't talk about Kashmir, uh, uh, talk about the human rights violations in Kashmir. Um, and I wanted to get a sense from you, um, from both of you, uh, why is that the case? Why has, um, has it remained such a difficult thing to, to break in the Indian media sphere, even though you have, you have many writers like Arundhati Roy and others who were part of the 2008 protests, who spoken uh, articulately about this issue, and the world, for, for the most part, has ignored Kashmir uh, for all these years. Unlike uh, Israel-Palestine, which is another conflict area where I spend a lot of time working, which has many interesting parallels with Kashmir that we could go into, uh, there isn't that kind of uh, uh, enterprise of the peace industry or the sort of uh, uh, prop, you know sort of the ongoing news cycle around Kashmir. So, what what is your sense of that, and, and how how has that changed, perhaps over the years? Um. Well, I think that Israel-Palestine, I don't like to use that analogy in relation to Kashmir. The stakes are different. Um, India and Pakistan do not have similar kinds of stakes involved as Israelis and Palestinians have in their conflict. Um, the problem in my view, which, uh, which I came to understand through years of study, uh, there's a cultivated ignorance about the history of Kashmir, the history of people's struggles there in both India and Pakistan, unfortunately. India, um, m at the popular level, uh, people see India as an integral, what they call an integral part of India, which is a very territorialist view of integration. Um, the state institutions of India, the government, its media, uh, tend to um, see Kashmir from this partition perspective, this binary perspective, and divide, kind of try to locate, um, I mean, they produce a criminal mode of history writing, criminal mode of media production where they see uh, Hindu and Muslim issue as being the center of what is, uh, of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. um, in Pakistan, unfortunately, they also have a very territorialist view. They see, they call it the jig jiggler vein of Pakistan. Uh, the reverse becomes central to their understanding, the water becomes central to their understanding of, um, um, Kashmir. Um, in India, we like to, I mean, we've been told that, um, they at, at least that um, for India, it's the secular crown. You know, they see it from that perspective that presence of Kashmir in within India suggests that India is a secular country. At the popular level in India, that's not the case. Most people do not see uh, Kashmir from those secularist perspective. Um, so, I have been invested in basically trying to see what does Kashmir look like when we don't look at it from the perspective of the partition, when we don't look at it from the lens of Hindus and Muslims. And I, then I go back, at, not to 1947, but pre-1947 struggles in Kashmir for good governance, for self-determination, for uh, freedom. We have um, historic struggles by peasants and workers in Kashmir trying to gain their rights. Um, Sheikh Abdullah, which you, whom you mentioned earlier, um, was a leader of a party that fully endorsed the idea of uh, freedom and independence. And even in 1944, had this big resolution called Naya Kashmir or New Kashmir, which envisaged um, you know, citizenship rights to all people not just Muslims, mm -hmm. but to Hindus and Sikhs, and who all have uh, history within the region. Um, so I try to understand how do people in Kashmir, beyond their religious affiliation, uh, imagine their country? Do they see themselves as part of either India or Pakistan? Do they, um, but for them it's not, it's not a territory. It's a lived space, it's a history of uh, that, um, it's, it's a history of struggle that they see when they look at it. I mean, the term azadi is not new. It's not something, uh, azadi means freedom, which has been kind of the um, call to freedom slogan, big slogan in Kashmir. It goes back way, uh, you know, beyond 1989, 90 to 1930s to even earlier in our literature, in our popular politics. So uh, that's what, how I see it, that there has been a cultivated ignorance about the history of Kashmir. And 
really, when we look at it, Kashmir from the prism of partition, it depoliticizes Kashmiris. It uh, either sees them as naive, who are uh, easily kind of swayed by Pakistan. Uh, you know, that, that's how Indian government would like to see us. Uh, or who are just like squatters uh, who should be pushed out, uh, you know. Or in Pakistan, they like to, they like to call Kashmiris brothers and sisters. But it again, it's like as if Kashmiris are like you know knocking on the doors for pa their patronage. That's not the case. They are a people under themselves who have a, their own history and politics. But then I want to ask you about uh, if you if you say that it's not uh, necessarily connected to partition, then but what about the call for the plebiscite, which is directly related to uh, the decision that happened in 1947? Yes, uh, as I said, the history of its uh, plebiscite is a technical term. It is connected to the UN resolutions. Uh, for sure, uh, India took the, uh, there's a complicated history uh, to how India took the case to the United Nations um, about the date. Um, Kashmiris like to not only see the, the tribal people, the so-called tribal people who came into Kashmir in 1947 as an invasion, but also the incursion of Indians um, in so-called defense of Kashmir as an invasion. Um, there is, there are, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the history of self-determination, the history of um, kind of asserting one's own role in history goes back way beyond 1947. And um, it is a technical term, I think, uh, Kashmiris are in a way caught up in precisely the dilemma that Nitin pointed out, that we're not visible on the international scene. What makes us visible is probably the conflict between India and Pakistan and the, the high stakes that are involved with both of them being nuclear um, uh, states. Uh, it's unfortunate we are dependent on this in terms of um, becoming visible, yet at the same time it invisibilizes Kashmiris um, their own struggle, their own demands. We don't hear their voices. We don't. Um, uh, we often hear a cacophony of like, who is right from India and Pakistan, you know, but not the Kashmiris. Um, I want to steer the discussion back to your 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 writing and your film work. Um, as as artists, as writers, how are you steering that discussion to broader audiences? Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the audiences for your film, um, how you've been trying to um, uh, enter into the, the Kashmiri sort of image of how we can understand Kashmir better, and in this case also through music. Because um, um, there are some stereotypes we have about Kashmir from the images we see, and you're breaking some of the stereotypes in your films. Uh, so maybe you can talk about both the political, politically driven f filmmaking you've been doing and this one more kind of ethnographic or, or fiction-based work and how you're entering that, that space? Mm, well, uh, music is, you know, one of the most incredible hallmarks of uh, the subcontinent. So it's, uh, and also one of the things as I, as I present in the film that especially these kind of traditional, this traditional music is, some of it is threatened because younger generations are not interested and that's sort of key to keeping it alive and going. And, uh, and it's also this particular music, the Sufi music, is uh, also very central to uh, one of the identities of Kashmir um, and maybe one of the more, you know, in, in, since the last uh, 400 or so years. Um, so, uh, but for me, in terms of the political, the, the, the documentary was very overtly and, and clearly a political investigation, you could say. And uh, the, uh, the new film, the surrealist fiction film, which was the third piece that you saw, you saw an excerpt of that. Uh, for me, that was, it was much more important to sort of uh, make the political content basically hidden. Uh, subversive um, to not make it the you know the, the the thing that is the central narrative of the film. I wanted the central narrative to revolve more around the construction and the aesthetics and uh, the um, 
the, the, the film language being more evocative rather than sort of telling you something. Uh, so, but in the end, what, what it was interesting for me was to work with the idea of, because any of these issues, whether it's political or it's personal, it's about who controls the narrative and you know, how does the narrative get told. So that was one of the key um, elements for me in the portrayal of this character in particular, but uh, in, in terms of how the film gets constructed. Um, so some of the political stuff is um, uh, more, um, more nuanced and more sort of uh, totally intertwined with the, the aesthetic and construction side of the process. Is that a feature length piece you're doing? How long is it? Yeah, that? that's about an hour. It's an hour. Yeah. Is, is it finished? Or are you oh yeah, it's already had its world premiere and it premiered at Victoria and Albert Museum in London and then it went to a museum in Germany. Uh, I, I mean, notice that there was almost no verbal um, dialogue in, in this excerpt we saw. Does that linger throughout the film? Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the film, which is about an hour, there's about three lines of dialogue. Um, and, uh, but there are other ways that things get communicated. One of them is the intertitles, which you saw, like I had a couple of intertitles in there. Uh, and uh, sometimes there's a little um, uh, subtitles as well. Uh, but that style of telling the story was the not uh, important for me in this film. Yeah. I also noticed a, a very nostalgic way that you were filming it. Uh, it. It almost feels like a Kashmir of a different time, or it evades time somehow. Um, and so I was wondering how you were dealing with time in the film. Um, and then at one point I noticed uh, you had was it Om Puri, the Indian actor, who was behind the man in the, in the uh, theater, offering flowers and then a gun. And obviously the audience can interpret that in so many different ways. Um, but um, you were trying to use these poetics to sort of deal with questions that are, tend to be much more wrought. Yeah. So I just wanted to have you think us through that. So the issue of time was uh, also a very central way of dealing with this uh, storytelling because I was really interested in sort of capturing something that is fluid and something that gives you a sense of when you're there you also get sometimes you you are in certain locations and you feel like you are in another decade uh, and you're not always in the present and uh, so I really wanted to capture that feeling and also the sort of philosophical aspect of uh, these narratives which um, are cyclical and also um, uh, they sort of, you know, they don't belong to any particular time. They, they are always existing and especially things that are considered uh, conflict or, um, you know, contested. Those things are what they call, f you know, especially Kashmir is called a frozen conflict. So uh, there is the sense that, you know, things kind of stay in a, a time and they don't shift, they don't change. and. Um, so that was, that's kind of part of what I was working with. But also for me on a visual level, I didn't want somebody on a cell phone or a computer. Mm. Um, so when you do see things like a phone or something, it would be an older phone. Uh, but I had almost no budget, so I didn't, and I couldn't you know, uh, recreate uh, to an extraordinary detail this a particular time period. So. I have lots of questions about the making of this film, but I want to just switch to Muhammad briefly to talk about your writing practice, about the kinds of things, the subjects you write about, and how you go about framing uh, your work. Uh, maybe just from a writer's perspective, maybe you can give us a sense of that. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, I just want to quickly also say about the Sufi music that uh, what it why it resonates with, I grew up in a family which was intensely involved with, so my mother was, uh, is a Sufi poet, um, and so I grew up in that atmosphere. Uh, my understanding has historically been that um, it represents a Kashmiri desire to create a unique place in the world for itself, but also to claim an integration with the larger world beyond its own borders. Sufiana music, for instance, comes to Kashmir from Central Asia, um, but Kashmiris over centuries um, change the tonalities, the 
the in music instruments that became associated with it and the subjects that they dealt with. In my own in my own writing, as an example, um, in two thousand fourteen, when I went, um, I I wanted to um, go around with young people, college going students, school going students, uh, to see how they walk through the streets. You know, these are streets which have seen uh, protests, which have seen killings and injuries, which have where soldiers are still present, and. So I wanted to kind of get a texture of what their everyday walking in these places that they inhabit is like. And I know that my own presence with uh, with these youth kind of evoked them to say things about that they remembered. But many times it was about um, how they remember somebody getting injured at one spot or somebody getting picked up or somebody get uh, tear gas coming down into the street. and them running for cover or them getting trapped um, inside somebody else's home for hours, which was kind of my own experience as a child. Uh, my own writing pra practice, therefore, is about how best to describe this textured understanding of the lewd reality in Kashmir. How do people actually inhabit a space like Kashmir, which is so militarized, which and also, um, there is not only the fear of, as um, um, somebody pointed out in the film, of the Indian gun, but also there were extremist elements within the movement itself uh, who created in a large amount of fear among people. Uh, I wanted to, for instance, walk with young women who, wear, who wore burqas and to try to see why do they wear burqa at, while at home they were not wearing burqas. And came to realize, and which one does not uh, un get to understand much, that they wore bur burqas uh, because there were soldiers present everywhere. They didn't want to be seen. Um, you know, they didn't have share that sense of familiarity that they would share with, let's say, Kashmiri men. You know, despite the fact that um, they were uh, among uh, the, the extremists within the movement, people who would ask women to wear burqas and stuff. So you have, um, this is the kind of textured understanding of the lived life in Kashmir that I want to get in my writing and to share with the world. So I'd like to open it up to uh, have you all ask questions to the panelists. And we have a microphone we can pass around. Maybe I'll do this. It's helpful for the uh, camera. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, I'm, I wanted to ask, uh, what what is the poetry and what are the lyrics of those the classical Sufi music? What, what are they? What is the what is the poetry about? I mean, do, are there certain themes that it uh, talks about, or that or not? Uh, we can take the question. No, I, <laughs> I, I, got, I have no idea. I assume it's love, mm -hmm. but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Poetry, yes. Right? Uh, yeah. So um, the two things that are important in Sufi poetry is uh, the what is called the ishke hakiki, the true love, uh, and the difference between the true love and the worldly love, the love for the material world. So Sufiana music is about exploration of the love for sometimes divine, some uh, the other worldly love, the love beyond this life, the true love, um, but it. It's also about the tonality, the, the music, the, the rhythm of the sound, uh, the immersion of people, uh, of the practitioners uh, into these tones. Um, uh, that becomes a way for people to achieve uh, the unity with that Ashki Hakiki. Yeah. Any questions? And if you have any questions, you know, or about the. There's a question over here. Um, my question is regarding, um, do you see in terms of like the kids and stuff that you, in Kashmir, do they have basic like education? Like how is this to access education for the kids in Kashmir and whatnot in terms of uh, schools? Do they have enough textbooks and or they have any computers, if so, at all. I'm just trying to figure out what's the 
situation of the youth in Kashmir? Um, it's actually um, an, a really important question, the question of education. If, um, people, yes, people go to schools. They're, and they're getting, there is an intense desire to get educated. Um, yes, um, people who can afford buy their own laptops and stuff. The schools are in a terrible condition. That's a different matter. But there are schools, and there are private schools, public schools, and things like that. Um, but the, the history of education is actually, there's a lot of desire among Kashmiris to get educated. And it goes back to the 30s, the struggle that I was mentioning. It started actually for uh, most Kashmiris, uh, like they wanted to get educated. They wanted the state to devote some resources for their education, which were not available. And that history goes on and on and on. But um, compared to, let's say, rest of South Asia, um, the literacy rate, which I don't know how much that matters, is slightly lower. But yes, people are educated. And just now in this, uh, since July, it, there have been uh, something like 100 or so schools that have been uh, set on fire. Yeah, schools have been like the first victims of uh, you know, arson in, in, in the 90s, like my own school was burned down. Um, we don't, never came to know who did it. They were obviously, um, it's hard to speculate. But yes, uh, there was Indian Army, when, like when you have like hundreds of thousands of people who are coming in, they didn't have anywhere to stay. So they occupied whatever space was available to them. It meant hospitals, schools. So if the militants, uh, burned the schools down. The impulse was that they would probably be occupied by soldiers, but it's a, it was a fair game then. And um, right now there are like, for instance, as I said, um, more than 100 days, uh, people have, uh, children have not gone to schools, um, and they want to go to schools, of course. And um, it's not 100, but probably around a dozen schools have been burned down in recent times. Has there been any discernible change in either the policies or practices of the central government with the BJP coming into power at the center? I think you should answer that. <laughs> Because I, I, I mean, I haven't been there in the last, uh, you know, since 2014. And when I was there in 2014, I uh, was in the area which is very much in the news right now, which is the, the, like sort of western side, which is the border with Pakistan. And that, so I was in Uri, Bandipur, uh, uh, Baramula, Sopur, all these areas that are in the news right now, and. Uh, the conversations I had uh, were basically people were sort of, in a way, they were sort of waiting for, at that time, Modi had not been elected, and it was like a couple of months away still, and they were sort of waiting uh, for him to be elected because they felt it was going to sort of justify uh, or sort of bring to a head the, the clash. And I think we're seeing that now. Um, The only thing I can add is that in New Delhi, there has been a lot of agitation in the universities that is pro-Kashmir and has been very brutally been shut down. Um, the Hindu right-wing government and their, um, they've created an atmosphere of kind of bullying around this issue uh, where any kind of conversation that's talking about the rights of Kashmiris uh, becomes cons is considered anti-nationalist. And in that atmosphere, you can imagine um, any human rights reports coming out, any kinds of um, real reporting on this issue tends to get less coverage, even in the media. So um, I don't think the Modi government has an interest in uh, accelerating uh, the, the conversation around uh, um, peace in Kashmir. They're, they're, really, they're bringing a more muscular foreign policy to the region. So we're going to see the effects of that over, over time. Just to add um, a context, like I, I assume that there, ha 
there has been a consistency with the way Indian government approaches Kashmir. In 2010, there was a Congress government uh, at the center, and um, a similar period of four months uh, was experienced in Kashmir, where more than 100 kids, actually, and teenagers were shot dead. So Congress had a similar muscular approach during that time. And uh, the only difference, uh, the two differences that I see in the present is that the Indian government is, it does not want to talk to Kashmiris. That's what it is saying. At least at the, although they keep sending people um, to talk to the Kashmiri leadership, the, especially the Hurriyat conference and stuff, but uh, at, because there are elections happening in Uttar Pradesh, uh, you know, uh, soon, I think probably that's the reason Indian, uh, the Modi government wants to take a much more nationalistic approach on this. Uh, the second thing is absolutely, I, I agree with Nitin on this, there is a discernible change on the Indian campuses, especially after the, um, the Dalit movement in India became much more visible, um, that Kashmir is openly being discussed, there are seminars happening, a place like JNU, Jadavpur University, Hyderabad Central University, these are places where um, things are beginning to shape, change, yeah. Can you pass the mic? To, oh, sorry. Did you have a question? Pastor? Yeah, can yes, I ahead. ask? Um, I'm curious to know what mm, the two of you uh, have to say about, um, based on your experiences and observation, um, what do young adults aspire to do? And, uh, what kind of life are they wanting? And uh, what can they want? I mean, I think like anybody, they don't want to live in a conflict zone and they want uh, things to normalize so that they can, you know, develop and have, uh, not live in fear. And I mean, I can tell from my experience of having gone there uh, on two different occasions uh, and traveling alone and, you know, not really, and I, you know, on the, by the second time I went there, I did have a couple of people that I knew there that I could reach out to when I was there. But when I first went, I didn't know anyone, and uh, I had never been in a place where there are just guns everywhere, and, uh, you know, where you feel literally any time you turn a corner that something might happen. And it did, it did have that very heightened sense of, like, you know, really at any minute. And... Uh, that was very, that was, uh, ver of course, very, very um, stressful. And after the first five days, I realized that I was really, really, really stressed out from that. And I thought that I, ha I just had to get out of there. Uh, but I had not finished whatever work I wanted to do. And so I just kind of uh, pushed myself to stay. And I stayed on for another five days. And by that time, I kind of, it, it, in a sense, I kind of like, you know, you could say kind of got used to it, but um, you don't ever really, you can't ever really be, you know, peaceful and feeling like you can uh, think in a long-term way. So, you know, like for instance, just now when they've had uh, these problems um, in Uri and it started to escalate very quickly between India and Pakistan and even in Punjab, they were telling people to leave the border area. So if you travel around a border area that is, you know, this kind of a border, uh, there's always this underlying sense that, you know, nothing is really okay and you can't really think about the future. You can't really ever be peaceful and, you know, just have a normal sense of what a day-to-day -day is. So even if you do, even if you do just wake up, go to school, go to the market, you know, that kind of thing, uh, it's never really just that. Uh, so, um, I mean, and tourism has been uh, a very strong component for uh, Kashmir, and that has really suffered. And so that means that some younger people who might be involved in that, it's become very difficult for them. Uh, so beyond that. Oh, well, most youth um, in Kashmir want independence of Kashmir. Um, and this comes from um, a tradition, a historic uh, understanding of what Kashmir is and how they understand Kashmir, but also from an intense desire for peace in their region and also across South Asia. Uh, the first victims of heightened tensions between India and Pakistan is Kashmiris. Whenever war drums uh, start 
either in Islamabad or New Delhi, and the shelling begins. It begins in Kashmir. Like there are uh, people across both the line of control, you know, villagers who have been suffering shelling for decades now. They live in bunkers. Uh, in Kashmir, uh, if like some general sneezes in Islamabad or a big politician sneezes in Delhi, we have a curfew in Kashmir. They had to um, hang a Kashmiri man in 2013, Afzal Guru, uh, who was charged uh, with um, supporting or helping people who attacked the Indian parliament. And they uh, uh, you know, did a curfew in Kashmir for a week. No schools, nothing, no movement, nothing. So anything that happens in terms of bad relations between India and Pakistan, Kashmiri suffer. Young people in Kashmir want peace, but they know that that peace cannot come without uh, a proper political resolution of Kashmir issue. They want themselves, they want their voices to be heard. They know that uh, only when India and Pakistan uh, understand the perspective of Kashmiris uh, will any resolution come about. Hard, but they, they know that it's difficult. Hi, um, my name is Jahangir. I'm uh, actually from Kashmir as well, and I actually didn't have a question. I wanted to add to what Junaid was saying to your question about uh, if things had changed in uh, Kashmir after the Modi government came into picture. Yes, it has changed. It has changed for the worst, because what the government has taken, they've taken a stand of a very hardline approach, and uh, they've implemented what was known as the Dawal, Dawal Doctrine, if you know, it was a national security advisor, Ajit Dawal, with a doctrine that was defined on uh, you know how to deal with the crisis and and they took that as an approach which is primarily you know take a hardline approach and it'll pass and that's the example of what Kashmiris are going through right now with the uh, 100 days of cur curfew because primarily it is primarily to show that you know they're not able to they're not ready to listen but the cycle if you look at it is primarily it's a cycle of deception that Kashmiris have been kind of uh, you know uh, used to or have been uh, victims of from inception and that's primarily what is driving this because you know the current government that is in uh, uh, control or in uh, ruling in Kashmir which is PDP People's Democratic Party they came into power they're campaigning uh, slogans where if you don't vote for us BJP will come into power <laughs> and after they got into uh, election cycle they actually shook hands with BJP and came into and implemented their policies so it's a cycle of deception until that ends uh, you know, Kashmir is always going to be a victim. So I just wanted to add to what you were saying. Question. Uh, I, I think I can. I, I can be loud yeah. enough. Uh. Um, just to change the topic a little bit, I just want to go back to the second film about the Sufi music. Um, I know it's a film; in, it's a work in progress, as you noted. Mm -hmm. uh, would there be? Uh, would you have a soundtrack, or does would the film also? contain any history about Sufi music or go into more detail in interviews. I just wanted to get a sense of what the film would be about and how much it would be get into the history of the music or what the future holds. I haven't really thought that far, <laughs> but, but actually, yes. I mean, that all of that makes sense, and that's one reason why I say it's a work in progress, because it's, uh, it was just an initial, literally one day uh, kind of shoot. and, if, and uh, um, I definitely would want to give it some kind of context and some kind of history, and so I can imagine it extending it to maybe double the length that it is now, uh, you know, under 30 minutes. Um, and then, you know, you can continue with that style or with that type of thing uh, throughout, you know, within the state or within, you know, the region. Uh, so that's one, that's why I called the series Music for the 21st Century, and um, so it's like kind of portraits of things that may or may not uh, be here, but will still in some way will have some kind of presence. So. Can we take one last question? Uh, or this two, maybe. We'll oh, try to sorry. Well, my, my question is kind of developing on that. I'm a media studies student. And um, yeah, I loved how you took uh, such something as engaging and light as music to show like something very heavy and um, important and um, I was wondering like during the film I know you said it was very like just like short and you are planning to like get more engaged in that but like the, um, I was thinking if did you see any potential of using music or something like 
um, and exploring more like through the instruments and to tell a bigger uh, story. Like maybe not there, but in other places, did you see the, the potential of like uh, sharing more about the history um, of the people, the ecology and everything through instruments? Is it a good place to start as a media student to say something like very heavy? Yeah, it's a very good uh, place to start. And actually in my first, uh, first film, the documentary, which is 77 minutes long, uh, throughout the film, I incorporate music wherever I have traveled, and, uh, and in, in, su in the subcontinent, that, that's not very difficult because there are all kinds of amazing uh, music. Even just somebody who's walking down the street might be humming a folk song, and, uh, and in fact, that is something that I incorporated in the film. Uh, so that became like a, a very strong component uh, in that, that film, where I used music to kind of also give a sense of place and um, and, and tone, of course, of place, and um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, what else? <laughs> well, part of what Gabrielle is trying to study is the, the kind of making of the instruments themselves. Oh, how yeah. They are indigenous to that culture. And oh, yeah, and yeah. What, you know, symbolism they might have. And is that something you've been exploring? Well, I mean, yeah, it could be. Um, you know, like for instance, some of those instruments have come from other regions, like even Afghanistan and whatever, and they've kind of transformed, like he was talking about how they've transformed the style or the intonation uh, to sort of, you know, be more localized, but yet part of that greater spirit of music and uh, or style of music. So the same with the instruments. Um, uh, so yeah, and. I had uh, a few years ago, I was going to do a documentary in, in Pakistan on the female singers and create a portrait of the country through the female singers over the years. Um, and I uh, didn't get to finish that piece, but that was a, a, a style that I was going to use music very much to denote uh, through the decades or through the you know eras. Um, and it's a very, very, very important part of the subcontinent. We're almost out of time. We, uh, there, was there a question here? I just wanted to. Uh, he gave me his turn. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, we'll uh, have to do this really I, quickly then. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, it's actually interesting how the conflict in Kashmir is related to other uh, conflicts in the region. Like, uh, we're making a film in uh, Gilgit Baltistan, and the situation there is very tied to the Kashmir conflict because un until that's resolved, other issues can't be resolved. And it's. It has this kind of a chain of reaction in the region. Um, you mentioned that the youth uh, most, mostly have this desire of the independence. I was wondering if, apart from the symbolic and traditional aspects of it, has there been kind of a more concrete kind of institutional initiatives by the youth, by the universities, or something like a plan forward? Has there been a proposal? Well, I. Uh, if you look at the history of the Tehrik movement itself, uh, which is the movement for uh, self-determination, it goes back uh, way back, as I said. But in 1989, it was primarily led by youth. You know, the the leadership of the rebels, of the the militants, of the people who were protesting on the streets were the young people. And um, even though they grew old over time, new generations of youth have become part of this this movement. So Tehrik is an expression, an institution. It's not an institution in the sense like it, it has offices. There are different parties. There are political parties. They have agendas. They have they distribute leaflets. They write their own histories. Um, you know, there was a moment in the film when you saw Zahiruddin, uh, who said, uh, "Which animal is the freedom of press?" Right. Uh, he is involved in a massive. Pro he was a young man. I interviewed him. He is one of my participants. He, I, um, he was a young man in 1989, and in, as a, a Kashmir University student, intensely involved in the Tehrik movement. Um, but when repression of that movement started, he uh, turned to journalism, began to write um, about Kashmir's history, and has produced several volumes of writings on Kashmir's present and the past. Uh, so yes, uh, Kash Kashmiri youth are involved in this in a much more serious way. Um, se second thing to keep in mind when we talk about Kashmiri youth is that um, more than three-fourths of Kashmiris across generations suffer from one or the other symptom of uh, traumatic stress disorder. You know, uh, 
it, there's not a moment uh, in Kashmir really when people can settle down and think about you know how to proceed towards future. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my own experience going from 1989, early years of 90s to 2008 and then in 2016, um, Kashmiris have not had a chance to kind of consolidate any of the movement's goals. Uh, one of the curious things that is happening over the years is that there's not a, a cohesion or unanimity about what would be the symbol of the movement. There's no single flag. You know, there's no sense of nationalism per se. People are tired of that idea, but they do want uh, freedom. They they do desire independence of Kashmir. And Gilgit Baltistan is an, an interesting question because it also uh, creates these internal frictions within the Tehreek. How do Kashmiris think about aspirations of people in Gilgit Baltistan who may or may not want to be part of an independent Kashmir or people in Ladakh who are evenly divided between Muslims and Buddhists and where people may not may, may want to be part of India rather than be part of uh, independent Kashmir or Pakistan you know so there are these internal contradictions there are internal situations that still have not been resolved just to add another thing to Sinan's question uh, the, the Kashmiri youth have been very very um, involved in social media and organizing in social media. So they, they may not have the sort of political platforms uh, that are visible, but they're very much uh, doing it in very distributed ways and, and very savvy uh, in, in how they're managing media. So Although it's, it's also a, a tricky thing. Um, this summer, uh, when I reached Delhi after like spending four weeks in curfew, I realized that my own Facebook account had been blocked. <laughs> so. I was, I had so many notes to share with the world, with my friends about what was happening in Kashmir, but I realized that I couldn't. So even though there is this involvement with social media, the government of India has an in with Mr. Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. you know, they can stop at any time. So mm -hmm. social media is there, but it's also not there. Also and the cell phones. Yeah. Can we take one last question and then we have to wrap up? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Imran. I'm also from Kashmir. My question is for Sarah. Uh, you said uh, your last trip to Kashmir was 2014. Uh, so is, if Kashmir is still a uh, topic of interest for you, would you like to do another feature film on the Kashmir with song and dance, like Indian style? <laughs> and uh, the second part of that is, what was your takeaway? Do I look like a filmmaker who makes song and dance? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. No, I know. Actually, my next film, I do have a, a scene with uh, a wonderful Bollywood song. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. No, with song and dance, I mean, maybe the Sufiana style. Yeah. Probably. Second thing, uh, what was your takeaway from Kashmir? Was it the sufferings of Kashmir or the rich cultural history of Kashmir? So when you think of Kashmir now, after what, how much time you spent there, is it the people, what they are going through, what people are going through in Kashmir with all the sufferings and other things, or is it uh, what the culture of Kashmir is? So I just want to understand from like somebody who went from here and non Kashmiri, when you come out of where you see the both sides of Kashmir, you've seen obviously you covered very, uh, pretty nicely whatever uh, Kashmir is, uh, culturally and uh, from other way also politically. What do you, what's your end thought? Uh, well, I mean, I think that there's no question that, you know, it has a very rich culture and uh, the landscape is um, absolutely intoxicating. That was one thing that I felt when I was there, that you don't always feel everywhere that you go that might be kind of different and beautiful. This actually had, for me anyway, a very seductive quality. And it was like after being there for about eight, nine days, you I felt like you didn't want to leave. There was just something that was very powerful, um, and that you can't, uh, you, you know, you you can't explain it. It's just something that you feel and you connect with. And uh, but the other thing that is uh, absolutely, you know, intense. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in the city or you're in the countryside, is an, a very, very, very overwhelming sense of uh, um, repression and oppression and always being on the edge and that is with this absolutely magnificent grand backdrop that you're in this place that is so overwhelmingly um, beautiful. So 
uh, so there's a, it, this is a very strong contradiction that exists um, in, in, a, in a very, very intense way constantly. Uh, so I have, I have this like, you know, feeling of wanting to be there, but then that when you get there and you're there for a, a while, you, you get uh, kind of, you get a little beaten down uh, psychologically. And so it's, it's, then you feel you need to just get out of there. And so that, I mean, that's been my experience um, in the two trips that I've made. Uh, but it's something that, you know, doesn't, um, doesn't dis it, you know, it never leaves you, that, that sense that, that you, you're drawn to it. Um. Sarah, thank you for sharing your films. I think these, these memories won't leave us uh, as we oh, hope to see you. the extended versions of your work. Uh, thank you all for coming today and uh, being with us. Thank you to <laughs> Professor Nitin Saune, Muhammad Junaid, Sarah Singh. Thank you to the team at ICI, the Indochina Institute, which did the event. Uh, Grace Hu, who handles events from the Indochina Institute. Yeah. Give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>